If you're wondering how to compare apples to apples when trying to pick the most appropriate choice mobile solar panel, well then, you've clicked on the right video. I'm primarily talking about this from the point of view of mobile or camping solar panels, but the principles that I'm talking about are also true for rooftop solar. I've divided this video into four sections. And so the first section being is uh, explaining what those advertised power ratings are. In the second section, I'll talk about what the most appropriate choice of panel to choose is. In the third section, I'll talk about the connectors that these come with. And then for the last section, I'll talk about just some common mistakes or common questions that may come up once you already have these panels. And so with that, I'll now get into the first section, that being what do these power rating numbers mean in the real world? And so take here this advertisement for a 100 watt solar panel. And so what does 100 watts mean? Well, a watt is basically a unit of measurement for how much energy is flowing through a wire at a given time. Let's just say hypothetically you wanted to power a 100 watt appliance. Does that mean that you could just directly plug in a 100 watt solar panel and run it? Well, unfortunately no, and this is for two reasons. The advertised power ratings on solar panels unfortunately do not reflect the real world. This basically is a reflection on how many watts this solar panel could generate if it was under extreme ideal perfect conditions. And when I say extreme ideal perfect conditions, I'm not talking about being in the Queensland outback. I'm talking about being literally in space with like zero atmosphere between that and the sun. It's just conditions that will never be met. So, for a 100 watt panel, how many watts do you think it would generate in the real world? Well, this comes down to two factors. And those two factors being how good a quality the solar panel that you're using is, and the other one being how bright the sun is wherever you happen to be on this planet called Earth. And so first up, what type of panel? Just to keep things simple, we'll assume that we're just always using a monocrystalline panel. And don't worry, I'll explain what they are in far more detail later on in the video. And as for the second question, as for how powerful the sun is for wherever you happen to live, for most habitated places in the Earth, it generally sits between the range of about 40% to 75% as far as how intense the sun is. And so just as an example, I live in Brisbane and our summers get extremely hot, so we would actually generate about 75 to 80% in the peak of a hot day in summer, whereas in the middle of winter, we'll probably only generate about 50%. But in order to find out the exact number of wattage, unfortunately, it is a little bit of a process and I'll be releasing a video about how to do this pretty accurately in the future. And so I'll leave that for being in that video. And so, now let's just go back to this 420 watt panel and let's just say that it is generating 300 watts. Does that mean that you could plug in a 300 watt appliance directly into the solar panel and you'll be able to run it without any issues? Unfortunately, no. And the second reason being for why this is, why you can't just directly plug it into it is that the power that comes from solar panels is unstable and unpredictable. And if you're running anything that's more complicated than a light bulb or a fan, unfortunately it will do damage to whatever you're trying to run. And so therefore, you find that basically every solar panel in use uh, that is actually running proper uh, appliances with it will either be fed into a battery or it will be fed into the overall power grid. And then it'll be the battery and the, or the power grid that then feeds that appliance. To cut a long story short, solar panels need a middleman to moderate the electricity that's going to the appliance. And another factor that I'll just bring up as well, because I know if I don't mention it, someone will say it in the comments, is that you have to consider the whole thing about direct current, alternating current as well. But I don't want to overcomplicate this video, so I'll save that for another day. Now let's move on to part two, and that being solar panel types. There are primarily three types of common designs that you find solar panels. They are monocrystalline, polycrystalline, and thin film. And without getting too nerdy or technical about this, I'll just keep this very simple. You basically always want to go with monocrystalline unless you're in a situation where you, you need to be light and mobile. And so why is this the best choice? Well, at any given moment, it takes the most amount of power out of the three designs. It takes power for a longer duration, meaning closer to sunrise and sunset and then what the other types of panels will. And it has a longer lifespan with warranties that go for up to 25 years as opposed to only 10 to 15 years. So in the short term, these types of panels are obviously more expensive. But when you consider how long the panel will last, in the long term, this panel will work out to be the cheapest as far as the amount of power that it'll provide you over the years when you factor that in. But to really ex properly explain the differences, if you do want to get nerdy about this, just see this table here. And so, uh, monocrystalline are basically the black solar panels, polycrystalline is the blue solar panels, and thin film is 
usually blue, but sometimes there's other colors as well. And so if you look at rooftop solar, you probably find that most of the modern installs have black solar panels, whereas the ones that are installed say 10 or 15 years ago have blue panels. And so as you're looking at these pictures, you've probably noticed these new percentage figures that are under the monocrystalline, polycrystalline and thin film panels. But these are not to be confused with, with having to do anything to do with the power rating, with, which is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, this is basically more of a theoretical concept as far as in the world of physics about how much energy there's stored in the sunlight that's hitting it and how much of that sunlight is actually being converted into electricity. And so the only thing that this metric for people in the real world can use this for is basically to compare solar panels to one another and which ones are more efficient. Uh, please feel free to pause this and so you can take down the information that you need to take down. But if you're not pausing it, let's keep the show moving. Some of you may be thinking right now, why is polycrystalline even a thing? Well, this was the best thing going around until monocrystalline was invented. All right, so now I'll move on to the next section of this video and that being the plugs or connectors for these solar panels. And so connectors or plugs are quite often an overlooked component when purchasing solar panels. And there's nothing more frustrating than when you've got this really good camping battery and then you get this perfectly good solar panel to match it. And then you find they just don't plug into each other and then you have to spend a hundred dollars on an adapter and then you lose some efficiency because of the adapter and it's just something that you want to avoid up front and so now i'm going to be talking about the two types of the most common adapters and so they are mc4 connectors and anderson plugs and so first i'll talk about mc4 connectors it seems to be that the way that the industry is heading it's not only is it uh, pretty common in camping solar panels but it is a standard for rooftop solar as well now, MC4 stands for multi-contact 4mm pin. And what's great about these plugs is that they're all physically the same size, uh, despite the amount of wattage that they're designed to handle. And so you'll never be caught with uh, having the right type of plug, but then in the wrong size. And another couple of great things about these plugs is that they're waterproof and they're very easy to use and they're pretty sturdy as far as holding together. Now, the other type of plug that you'll find that's pretty common in the industry is an Anderson plug. These do take up a lot more physical size than the MC4 connectors, and unfortunately you do get different sizes. You might get a 50 Anderson plug, a 75 Anderson plug, or a 150 Anderson plug. And so it's pretty frustrating when you actually have purchased the right type of plug being an Anderson plug, and then you find out it's the wrong size for whatever you're trying to connect to. And so with me having such a personal preference for MC4 over Anderson plugs, why am I even talking about Anderson plugs? Well, Anderson plugs are very common in camper vans or caravans. And so if you're buying panels to attach to one of those, you'll probably find that there's already Anderson connectors there. And if you are wanting to add a panel to that system, well then obviously you'd want to be able to connect directly to it rather than having to buy an adapter later on. And so for most people, I'd say get the MC4 connector. But if you have a caravan or camping setup, check that they're using Anderson plugs. And if they are, unfortunately that's what you're stuck with. All right, so now let's just get to the last part of this video, and that is uh, extra things to consider or extra things that you may not have thought of until after you already have the panels. And so one thing that may pop up is, what if you already have some panels from one brand, and now you've just purchased some panels in another brand, uh, can you put them in a series to feed a battery? Well, long story short of this is that the answer is yes, but it's not really encouraged. And so the reason why this is not encouraged is that it's going to very much hinder the efficiency of what these panels could produce. If you can find a way to feed this battery in parallel rather than in series, you're going to have a far more optimal result. And now for the last consideration. When you open these panels up out of the box and you take them out and use them for the first time, you'll find that they will always work pretty much as well as advertised, but you'll find that over the years they get less and less uh, efficient over time. And the, what, the best way to prevent this is by doing two things. Uh, one is to regularly clean them and stop any gunk from building up on the surface. I mean, that's pretty common sense. And another factor too is that with these mobile or camping solar panel setups, is that they're not designed to be left out in the elements 24-7 for basically years at a time. Although rooftop solar is designed to be able to withstand that, your camping panels are not. If you're going out camping, by all means, use it, go crazy with it. But then for the times that you're not using it, actually pack it away and put it indoors. Or if it's even raining and you're camping, it's not going to be doing much for you, so you might as well keep it out of the elements so the panel will last a little bit longer. And so that's basically everything I have to say as far as the process of uh, being able to select the right type of solar panel and the right type of connectors and so on and so forth. 